Hello, Assalamu alaikum. So, this week our topic will be interface and politics. So, previously we discussed about distributed cognition and task analysis. So, now we will discuss about interface and politics. So, let's dive into this. So, in 1980, Langdon Winner published a highly influential essay in which he asked, Do, artifact, do artifacts have politics? In other words, do technical devices have political qualities? And the answer is yes. All toasters are democrats and thermostates as you might expect are members of labor party. And surprisingly, automobiles are actually green party members. Okay, I am just kidding. So that's not what we mean when we ask if artifacts have politics. Here, when we say politics, we mean whether artifacts can personify specific forms of authority or power, whether for good or bad. What we are referring to is the fact that artifacts are interfaces we design that change the world around us, just the way politicians or business interests do. Sometimes, by design, we might design interfaces not for usability or research, but to create change in the world. Other times, that social change happens in ways we didn't anticipate it. We design interfaces that are used and affect the world in ways we never anticipate. So in this lecture video, we are going to talk about two dimensions of this. Designing for change and anticipating the change from our designs. We'll also touch on a field that explores these issues more deeply called value sensitive design. So let's talk about change which is a kind of a motivation for some interface designing so most commonly in HCI we are interested in designing for usability we want to make tasks easier through technology so in a car we might be interested in designing a GPS that can be used with the fewest number of taps or a dashboard that surfaces the most important information at the right time sometimes we are also interested in designing for research though we might design a dashboard that includes some kind of visualization of the speed to see if that is speed changes the way that the person perceives how fast that they are going. But a third motivation is to somehow change the user's behavior. Designing for change in response to some value that we have oftentimes that may actually conflict with those other motivations. If we are trying to discourage an un unhealthy habit, we might want to make the interface more that habit less usable. Cars actually have a lot of interfaces created with motivation in a mind. If I started driving without a seat belt on, my car will beep at me. Some cars will cap your speed at a certain number. Those interfaces serve no usability goals but rather they serve the goal of user safety. Now that's a simplistic example but it shows what I call the three goals of HCI. Help a user do a task, understand how a user does a task or change the way a user does a task due to some value that we hold like safety or privacy. So the most influential paper on the inner play between artifacts and politics came from Langdon Winner in 1980. The paper describes numerous ways in which technologies, interfaces and other artifacts demonstrate political qualities, demonstrate political motivations. For example, he opens by nothing, noting the belief that nuclear power can only be used in a totalitarian society because of the inherent danger of the technology. Solar power on the other hand pushes society towards a more distributed and egalitarian structure. But of course, we understand that nuclear power isn't on its own authoritarian. It has no consciousness. It can take political power. Winner is proposing that the push for certain technologies carries with it certain necessary political adjustments. That's part of what it means to suggest that artifacts have politics. In the paper, Winner outlines two distinct ways in which artifacts can be political. One type is inherently political technologies. These are technologies that due to their very design are only compatible with certain political structures. 
certain technologies like nuclear power whether due to complexity or safety or resources require considerable top down organization those lend themselves to authoritarian power structures others like solar power some wine someone might argue are only possible in a more distributive and egalitarian society so these technologies by their very nature dictate the need for certain political structures the other type he discusses are technical arrangements as forms of order technologies can be used to achieve changes to social order when used in the correct way the technology itself has no inherent political leanings like nuclear or solar power but it's used in a particular context for a particular purpose can nonetheless accomplish some political goals winner uses the example of a factory in chicago in 1880s they replaced the workers with automated machines that produce inferior goods as a way of busting up the union the new technology was actually inferior but it was used to serve a political purpose so according to winner artifacts may have two kinds of politics they may be inherently political in that they are only compatible with certain forms of political order or they may be used to achieve political motives even though they have no inherent political politics on their own this actually reminds me of the case of uh, the tesla versus edison if you haven't gone through that particular case you should read the history and go with that case to understand the interface and the politics the politics behind the inventions so it's a very um, kind of an interesting take on how the technology can divide the people in terms of politics so of course uh, let's start with the bad news the ability of interfaces to change behavior can be abused we are not just just talking about places where people put explicit barriers up lying blocking certain people from accessing their content there are instances where people create seemingly normal designs with underlying political motivations when it describes one such instance in his essay do artifacts have politics robert moses was an influential city planner working in new york city in the early 1900s as part of his role he oversaw the construction of many beautiful parks on long island he also oversaw the construction of parkways roads to bring the people of new york to these parks that's actually where the word parkway comes from but something unfortunate happened the bridges along these parkway parkways were too low for buses to pass under them as a result public transportation couldn't really run easily to his parks and as a result of that only people wealthy enough to own cars were able to visit his parks what an unfortunate coincidence right the evidence shows it's anything but coincidence moses intentionally constructed those bridges to be too low for buses to pass under as a way of keeping poor people from visiting his parks his political motivations directly informed the design of the infrastructure and the design of the infrastructure had profound social implications this is an example of winner's technology as a form of social order the bridges could have been taller there's nothing inherently political about those bridges it was the way that they were used that accomplished this political motivation as an interesting aside i learned recently that the design of central park inside new york city was an example of the exact opposite dynamic the designers were encouraged to put in places where only carriages could access so affluent people would have somewhere to go away from poor people but the designers specifically made the entire park accessible to everyone it's not too hard to imagine things kind of like that happening today either one of the arguments from proponents of net neutrality is that without it companies can set up fast lanes that prioritize their own content or worse severely diminished content of their competitors or content critical of the company however there is a positive side to it now we can design for positive social changes well though this goes beyond just encouraging people to be nice or banning bad behavior 
interfaces can be designed that will lead to positive social change through natural interaction with the system. One example of this is that I like is Facebook's ubiquitous like button. For years, many people have argued for a dislike button to complement the like button. Facebook has stuck with the like button though because by its design, it only supports positive interactions. It dodges cyberbullying, it dodges negativity. For usability purposes, it's a weakness because there are interactions I can't have naturally in this interface. But this specific part of the like button wasn't designed with usability in mind. More recently, Facebook has added to the like button with six new emoticons. Love, care, haha, wow, sad and angry. Even with this, these six new emoticons though, the overall connotation is still positive. For four of them, it's obvious why love, care, haha and wow are more positive emoticons. Sad and angry are negative emoticons, but used in this context, they take on more of a sympathetic connotation. If someone is ranting about getting into a car accident, it seems too weird to like that. But if you react with this angry emoticon, then you are basically saying you are angry on their behalf. It might be possible to use this for the more negative connotation like if someone said they like a political candidate and you react angrily then you could be opposing their political view and it's kind of like a norm in these days on the social media but in the majority of cases these are still going to be used in a way that fosters positive interaction so it seems that this interface was designed to foster positive social interactions online at the expense of usability it would come with supporting all social interactions online this also doesn't have to be strictly about dictating change, but it can also be about supporting change. For example, until a few years ago, Facebook had a more limited set of relationship options. They had married, engaged, in a relationship, single, and it's complicated. As its target audience went from being college students to everyone, they also added separated, divorced, and widowed. But it was a couple of years after that they then added in a civil union and in a domestic partnership. Adding these concepts didn't magically create these social constructs. They existed legally before Facebook added them here. But adding them here supported an ongoing societal trend and gave them some validity and made people for whom these were the accurate relationship labels feel like they really were part of Facebook's target audience. They were part of modern culture that an accurate representation of the relationship status was available on this drop down meant that they could accurately portray who they were on their facebook profile they didn't they do not have to pretend somehow the same can be said for the more recent trend on to expand facebook's gender options to allow people to put in a custom gender this supports a diverse group of people feeling as if the interface is designed with them in mind which in turn supports society's general movement towards acceptance. Now let's see a design challenge. This is we, the programmers. Let's tackle a change by design, by designing something for ourselves. So the programmer has a desk job. That means he spends a lot of his time sitting. However, for health reasons, it's best for him to get up once per hour and walk around just for a few minutes. There are a lot of ways we could tackle this by physically changing the design of his environment to a standing desk or by giving him an app that directly reminds him or rewards him for moving around. But let's try to do something a little bit more subtle. So let's design something for programmer's smartphone that gets to move around for a couple of minutes every hour without directly reminding him to walk around or rewarding him for doing so. So here's one idea. But before that, before I propose my ideas, I would like to think, I would like you to think for a while that what can be a particular design or what can be a particular app which could help to achieve this task. So here's one idea. 
Imagine a weather tracking app that crowdsources weather monitoring. Every hour, participants are buzzed to go outside and let their phone take some temperature readings, maybe take a picture of the sky. That design has nothing at all to do with moving around, but that's the side effect of it. Participation in this seemingly unrelated activity has the benefit of getting people moving. Pokemon Go is a great example of this in a different context. It doesn't spark the same kind of intermittent exercise, but it gets people to exercise more generally, all without ever actually telling them to do so. Now let's see a positive change by happens instead. Positive change doesn't always have to happen by design, though. In fact, there are numerous examples of positive change happening more as a byproduct of technological advancement rather than as a goal of it. In bikers of bicycles, backlights, and bulbs, this is the bicycle example. The story looks at that women can do before and after the invention of the bicycle. Before the bicycle, women tend to be pretty reliant on men for transportation. People generally got around with carriages, which were pretty expensive, so only wealthy people would own them. And so, typically, men would own them. So, if a woman wanted to go to a restaurant or to go to a show, she typically had to go with either her spouse or with her father. As a result, society rarely saw women acting individually. They were usually in the company of whoever the prominent male in their life was at the time. But then the bicycle came along. The bicycle was affordable enough and targeted at individuals so now women could get around on their own. So now a woman could go to a show or could go to a restaurant by herself instead of relying on a man to take her. In the book though, what Biker covers is not just the fact that this enabled more individual transportation, but rather that this enabled a profound social shift. This technological innovation allowed women to start acting independently. And it also demanded a wardrobe change, interestingly enough, because you couldn't wear a dress on a bicycle. So the invention of the bicycle simultaneously changed women's attire and change the level of independence they could show in modern society. And both these changes forced society to challenge traditional gender roles. The bicycle's role in women's liberation was so significant that Susan B. Anthony actually once said, I think bicycling has done more to emancipate women than anything else in the world. But when the bicycle was invented, it's doubtful that the inventor sat down and said, surely this will be a great way to emancipate women and change our culture's gender roles. That's not what they had in mind. They were inventing a technological device. But as an unintended positive side effect, the technological device profoundly changed society. We can say the same about a kind of Xbox or more uh, technically saying the depth camera now the depth camera was actually designed to like interact with humans but it was uh, the social implications or the technological implications was not thought at that time and currently we use these xboxes or the kinect devices or the depth cameras for variety of applications such as surveillance such as activity recognition such as making some interfaces which could be interacted with the humans more uh, sophistically or such as virtual reality or augmented reality and all those stuff are actually uh, one of the ways to praise the technological advancement which was brought through depth cameras. Now of course there is, uh, there, there is a positive side, there is also a negative side. A good example of this is the proliferation of the internet in the first place. When the internet first came along, it piggybacked on existing phone lines. Then it started piggybacking on more expensive cable TV lines. And now it's following along with very expensive fiber optic lines. At every stage of the process, areas with more well-developed infrastructure get the latest internet speeds first. However, Generally, the areas with well-developed infrastructures are the wealthier areas in the first place. 
either because wealthier citizens paid for the improved infrastructure or because people with the means to move wherever they went to their wherever they want to move will move somewhere with better infrastructure high speed internet access is a big economic boom and yet areas that are already economically advantaged are generally the first ones to get higher speed internet access even today in poorer parts of the united states the only available internet connections are slow unreliable satellite connections with strict data caps and in the rest of the world this issue can be even more profound where many areas have no internet access whatsoever and yet this isn't intentional unlike the bridges on long island no one is saying let's withhold broadband access from poor people to keep them poor instead it's natural to install better connections where there's actually an existing infrastructure to build on but that very natural plan has profoundly negative implications for equitable access to the internet so if we are not careful completely innocent and completely logical design ideas can actually perpetuate negative effects in the society so i will end this video now and we will talk about uh, we will talk more about the value sensitivity in the, our next lecture or this next part of this video thank you